Lesson 11 Practicing Supreme Loyalty to Christ Sabbath Afternoon September 2 The requirements of the parent should always be reasonable. Kindness should be expressed, not by foolish indulgence, but by wise direction. Parents are to teach their children pleasantly, without scolding or fault-finding, seeking to bind the hearts of the little ones to them by silken cords of love. The combined influence of authority and love will make it possible to hold firmly and kindly the reins of family government. An eye single to the glory of God and to what our children owe Him will keep us from looseness and from sanctioning evil. The Faith I Live By, page 266. God sees men's hearts and characters when they do not see their own state correctly. He sees that his work and cause will suffer if wrongs are not corrected that exist in themselves unobserved and therefore uncorrected. Christ calls us his servants if we do what he commands us. There is to every man assigned his particular sphere, place, and work, and God asks no more and no less from the lowliest as well as the greatest, than that they fulfill their calling. We are not our own property. We have become servants of Christ by grace. We are the purchase of the blood of the Son of God. This Day with God, page 166. The Lord is acquainted with us individually. Everyone born into the world is given his or her work to do for the purpose of making the world better. Each one has his sphere, and if the human agent makes God his counselor, then there will be no working at cross-purposes with God. He allots to everyone a place and a work, and if we individually submit ourselves to be worked by the Lord, however confused and tangled life may seem to our eyes, God has a purpose in it all, and the human machinery, obedient under the hand of divine wisdom, will accomplish the purposes of God. As in a well-disciplined army, every soldier has his allotted position and is required to act his part in contributing to the strength and perfection of the whole, so the worker for God must do his allotted part in the great work of God. Our Heavenly Father is our ruler, and we must submit to his discipline. We are members of his family. He has a right to our service. And if one of the members of his family would persist in having his own way, persist in doing just that which he pleases, that spirit would bring about a disordered and perplexing state of things. We must not study to have our own way, but God's way and God's will. Let God speak, and we will say, Not my will, but thy will, O God, be done. In Heavenly Places, page 228. Sunday, September 3. Advice to Children Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Children are admonished by the apostle to obey their parents in the Lord, to be helpful and submissive. Those who truly love God will not strive for their own way and thus bring unhappiness to themselves and to others. They will strive to represent Christ in character. How precious is the thought that the youth who strive against sin, who believe and wait and watch for Christ's appearing, who submit to parental authority and who love the Lord Jesus, will be among those who love His appearing and who meet Him in peace. These will stand without spot or wrinkle before the throne of God and enjoy His favor forever. They have formed lovely characters. They have guarded their speech. They have not spoken falsely. They have guarded their actions that they should not do any evil thing, and they are crowned with everlasting life. In Heavenly Places, page 216. Remember that children have rights which must be respected. Children have claims which their parents should acknowledge and respect. They have a right to such an education and training as will make them useful, respected, 
and beloved members of society here and give them a moral fitness for the society of the pure and holy hereafter. The young should be taught that both their present and their future well-being depend to a great degree on the habits they form in childhood and youth. They should be early accustomed to submission, self-denial, and a regard for others' happiness. They should be taught to subdue the hasty temper, to withhold the passionate word, to manifest unvarying kindness, courtesy, and self-control. The Adventist Home Page 306. Those who cultivate love in the home life will form characters after Christ's likeness, and they will be constrained to exert a helpful influence beyond the family circle in order that they may bless others by kind, thoughtful ministrations, by pleasant words, by Christ-like sympathy, by acts of benevolence. They will be quick to discern those who have hungry hearts and will make a feast for those who are needy and afflicted. Those who have heavenly discernment, who exercise tender regard for every member of the family, will, in doing their whole duty, fit themselves to do a work that will brighten other homes and will teach others by precept and example what it is that will make home happy. By their wisdom and justice, by the purity and benevolence of their daily life, by their devotion to the interests of the people, and they idolaters, Joseph and Daniel proved themselves true to the principles of their early training, true to him whose representatives they were. Welfare Ministry, page 299. Monday, September 4. Advice to Parents A Christian father is the house band of his family, binding them close to the throne of God. Never is his interest in his children to flag. The father who has a family of boys should not leave these restless boys wholly to the care of the mother. He should make himself their companion and friend. He should exert himself to keep them from evil associates. He should take more of the burden upon himself, doing all in his power to lead his boys to God. When children lose their self-control and speak passionate words, the parents should for a time keep silent. Silence is golden and will do more to bring repentance than any words that can be uttered. Satan is well pleased when parents irritate their children by speaking harsh, angry words. Fathers, Provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Let your calmness help to restore them to a proper frame of mind. The Faith I Live By, page 265. Some parents raise many a storm by their lack of self-control. Instead of kindly asking the children to do this or that, they order them in a scolding tone, and at the same time a censure or reproof is on their lips which the children have not merited. Parents, this course pursued toward your children destroys their cheerfulness and ambition. They do your bidding not from love, but because they dare not do otherwise. Their heart is not in the matter. It is a drudgery instead of a pleasure and this often leads them to forget to follow out all your directions, which increases your irritation and makes it still worse for the children. The fault-finding is repeated, their bad conduct arrayed before them in glowing colors until discouragement comes over them and they are not particular whether they please or not. A spirit of I don't care seizes them and they seek that pleasure and enjoyment away from home, away from their parents. Child Guidance, page 281. Gentle manners, cheerful conversation, and loving acts will bind the hearts of children to their parents by the silken cords of affection and will do more to make home attractive than the rarest ornaments that can be bought for gold. Tender affection should ever be cherished between husband and wife, parents and children, brothers and sisters. Every hasty word should be checked, 
and there should not be even the appearance of the lack of love one for another. Children are to respect and reverence their parents, and parents are to manifest patience, kindness, and affection for their children. Each one should seek in every possible way to please and make happy the members of the family circle. The Faith I Live By, page 267. Tuesday, September 5. Slavery in Paul's Day. Among those who gave their hearts to God through the labors of Paul in Rome was Onesimus, a pagan slave who had wronged his master, Philemon, a Christian believer in Colossia, and had escaped to Rome. In the kindness of his heart, Paul sought to relieve the poverty and distress of the wretched fugitive, and then endeavored to shed the light of truth into his darkened mind. Onesimus listened to the words of life, confessed his sins, and was converted to the faith of Christ. Paul made Onesimus the bearer of a letter to Philemon in which, with his usual tact and kindness, the apostle pleaded the cause of the repentant slave. Paul might have urged upon Philemon his duty as a Christian, but he chose rather the language of entreaty. The apostle asked Philemon, in view of the conversion of Onesimus, to receive the repentant slave as his own child, showing him such affection that he would choose to dwell with his former master, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. The apostle well knew the severity which masters exercised toward their slaves, and he knew also that Philemon was greatly incensed because of the conduct of his servant. He tried to write to him in a way that would arouse his deepest and tenderest feelings as a Christian. The conversion of Onesimus had made him a brother in the faith, and any punishment inflicted on this new convert would be regarded by Paul as inflicted on himself. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 456 and 457. Some masters, more humane than others, were more indulgent toward their servants. But the vast majority of the wealthy and noble, given up without restraint to the indulgence of lust, passion, and appetite, made their slaves the wretched victims of caprice and tyranny. The tendency of the whole system was hopelessly degrading. It was not the Apostle Paul's work to overturn arbitrarily or suddenly the established order of society. To attempt this would be to prevent the success of the gospel. But he taught principles which struck at the very foundation of slavery and which, if carried into effect, would surely undermine the whole system. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, he declared. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. When converted, the slave became a member of the body of Christ, and as such was to be loved and treated as a brother, a fellow heir with his master to the blessings of God and the privileges of the gospel. On the other hand, servants were to perform their duties, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Christianity makes a strong bond of union between master and slave, king and subject, the gospel minister and the degraded sinner who has found in Christ cleansing from sin. They have been washed in the same blood, quickened by the same spirit, and they are made one in Christ Jesus. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 459 and 460. Wednesday, September 6. Slaves of Christ. True conversion makes us strictly honest in our dealings with our fellow men. It makes us faithful in our everyday work. Every sincere follower of Christ will show that the religion of the Bible qualifies him to use his talents in the Master's service. Not slothful in business. These words will be fulfilled in the life of every Christian. 
Even though your work may seem to be a drudgery, you may ennoble it by the way in which you do it. Do it as unto the Lord. Do it cheerfully and with heaven-born dignity. It is the noble principles which are brought into the work that make it wholly acceptable in the Lord's sight. True service links the lowliest of God's servants on earth with the highest of his servants in the courts above. Messages to Young People, page 72. Is it the disposition generally among servants to do as much as possible? Is it not rather the prevalent fashion to slide through the work as quickly, as easily as possible, and obtain the wages at as little cost to themselves as they can? The object is not to be as thorough as possible, but to get the remuneration. Those who profess to be the servants of Christ should not forget the injunction of the Apostle Paul. Servants, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Those who enter the work as eye servants will find that their work cannot bear the inspection of men or of angels. The thing essential for successful work is a knowledge of Christ, for this knowledge will give sound principles of right, impart a noble, unselfish spirit like that of our Savior whom we profess to serve. Faithfulness, economy, caretaking, thoroughness should characterize all our work, wherever we may be, whether in the kitchen, in the workshop, in the office of publication, in the sanitarium, in the college, or wherever we are stationed in the vineyard of the Lord. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. The Review and Herald, September 22, 1891 Whatever the hand finds to do should be done with thoroughness and dispatch, faithfulness and integrity in little things the performance of little duties and little deeds of kindness will cheer and gladden the pathway of life. And when our work on earth is ended, every one of the little duties performed with fidelity will be treasured as a precious gem before God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 591. Thursday September 7. Masters who are slaves. The people of Athens were carried away with admiration for Paul's earnest and logical presentation of the attributes of the true God, of his creative power, and the existence of his overruling providence. With earnest and fervid eloquence, the apostle declared, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. The heavens were not large enough to contain God. How much less were the temples made by human hands? In that age of caste, when the rights of men were often unrecognized, Paul set forth the great truth of human brotherhood, declaring that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. In the sight of God, all are on an equality, and to the Creator every human being owes supreme allegiance. Then the Apostle showed how, through all God's dealings with man, His purpose of grace and mercy runs like a thread of gold. He hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 237 and 238. When Christ left heaven to come to its aid, he saw humanity sunken in wretchedness and sinfulness. He knew that men and women were depraved and degraded, and that they cherished the most loathsome vices. 
angels marveled that Christ should undertake what seemed to them a hopeless task. They marveled that God could tolerate a race so sinful. They could see no room for love. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 3 verse 16. Christ came to this earth with a message of mercy and forgiveness. He laid the foundation for a religion by which Jew and Gentile, black and white, free and bond, are linked together in one common brotherhood recognized as equal in the sight of God. The Savior has a boundless love for every human being. In each one he sees capacity for improvement. With divine energy and hope, he greets those for whom he has given his life. In his strength, they can live a life rich in good works, filled with the power of the Spirit. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 225. For further reading, Maranatha, Unexpected Recompense page 359, and Gospel Workers, A Season of Trust and Privilege, pages 267 and 268.